Imagine what it was like in ancient Egypt when every family who had ignored God's command woke up to find their oldest child dead. What a horrible thought. Welcome to Through the Bible. In our five-year study, Through the Whole Word of God, we travel to Exodus chapter 12 today. It's an important chapter, and it calls us to remember God's rescue. Even to this day, did you know that Jewish people observe this day? It's called the Passover. Together, we'll study the origin of this significant day, and we'll discover how God wasn't only teaching the Hebrews, but all those who hear and believe his word. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as you find your seat on the Bible bus, Greg and I are so excited to share one reason why we love the Word of God. So, Greg, I know that you're going to be bringing in stories today that celebrate that. Tell us about it. Yeah, Steve, uh, that's that's just the theme of our ministry. Every week, uh, testimonies pour in from all over the world about how God's Word changes people's lives. And we're going to start with an audio clip from Alvin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve, we had an interesting question that came in from a listener recently. They said, are are all of these uh, testimonies, are they current? Are you digging them up from 40 years ago? Yeah. And uh, the majority, the preponderance are current. Now, once in a while, when one illustrates a a theme or a trend... Or if Dr. McGee read it. uh, Of course, of course, we will bring that out. And this one uh, from Alvin is one that we've played before, but it's very powerful. Let's give it a listen. I'm just calling to tell you that by listening to your radio and the ministers on your program, uh, that it has helped me tremendously. It helped me overcome the things that I was doing in the world. I was an alcoholic and a drug addict, crack and crack cocaine, pile of cocaine, marijuana. But by listening to y'all on a daily basis and by the Holy Spirit convicting my heart, it turned my life around. Now I'm free drug-free and sober. Thank you. Man, this is just a recurring yes. the theme that we're hearing more and more, and that it's the way the Holy Spirit moves in people's lives, not independently, but using the Word of God yes. to make that change happen. Now, as we move around the world, I love this aspect of the ministry. We're now going over to Madagascar for this particular testimony. I live in a very remote place called Oh, here we go. <laughs> Don't even try. It is a long word. Magata Bohaganigi or something very, like that. Okay. It's... Small village, it's two days' walk from a city. Mostly rice farmers live there. So it has been two weeks listening to your preaching on the short wave. And I want to break right there. Short wave. We don't use it very often, but in certain places, yes. it still makes sense. Very old technology yes. that we're using still today because it makes sense. I continue. So we're very happy to hear God's Word being clearly explained Through your words, we already feel the Spirit of God moving in here. That is the reason we call you and will call you again, because our place in total darkness needs the gospel message. (laughs) And Steve, you called out something very important, and you've heard me say it before, and you'll hear me say it again. We are media agnostic. We want to do what gets the gospel to people. If it's carrier pigeons, we'll use carrier pigeons. Now, we haven't found anywhere on earth that that's effective, but your point about shortwave radio is a good one. In very rural, very remote uh, places like this, where it's a two-day walk to the city, and I have a suspicion that we wouldn't regard the city that he walks to as anything more than a village. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and so we just want to get the Word of God. And did you notice he said we've been listening for two weeks? Just after two weeks, they're having a huge impact in the community. I also love the way they call out the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is moving in here. Yes, yes, already, after two weeks. Yeah, it's wonderful. All right, let's move on. Another powerful uh, transformation story from Poland through the Bible Polish. Weakness forced me to prove to everyone around that I am strong and brave. It caused me much trouble and heartache. Through listening to Through the Bible, I now know that the love of Jesus set me free from all that. I fail sometimes, and so I am not pleased with myself, but I'm learning humbly, and sometimes I can see some small fruit. Please pray for me. Wow, that is such an encouragement. Greg, we love these stories. We'd love for you to share your story with us. You can go to BibleBus at ttb.org. You can also upload that video, Why I Love the Bible, by going to ttb.org forward slash love. Greg, why don't you pray for us? Father, thank you for continuing to transform lives with your word. We pray that it will continue to happen in the days, months, and years ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time we were dealing with the Passover feast. And you will recall that 
We came to verse 13, and that was the last verse we had in the 12th chapter. And I read, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, these are the instructions that God gave, and he said that when he saw the blood, he would pass over. Now, that was not some mystic or superstitious sign at all. There's a great principle that runs all the way through the Word of God, and it is without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In other words, God cannot arbitrarily or big-heartedly shut his eyes to sin and do nothing about it any more than a judge when there is brought before him one guilty, the judge should apply the law and the penalty should be paid. And I think, frankly, our problem in America today has been the laxity that has come in the enforcement of law. The important thing is that in God's universe, while law is inexorable, and the soul that sinneth it must die, therefore life must be given up for me, a sinner. You see, the death sentence is on all of us. Now, if you will accept Christ by faith, you'll be saved. Now, that night in Egypt, on every home, there would be the death of the firstborn. The death angel went through, and the blood was an indication, the application of it on the doorposts and the lintels was an indication of faith, you see. That answers the appropriation of a personal faith. And that was all that was necessary. They didn't put the blood out there and something else. They're good works. They didn't bring an offering like Cain. All that was necessary was just simply this. And the death angel, when he came, when he saw that, he passed over. There followed the Passover feast. And you will find out that when we get to Leviticus, that there'll be instructions given for the Passover and then the feast of unleavened bread which actually was part of it, but took place really after the Passover. And in verse 14, I read, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses, for whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now, actually, this had nothing to do with the death angel passing over. This was a feast of fellowship of those within, and it was a wonderful time of fellowship. It was duty, of course. God commanded it, and it was also a privilege but it hadn't anything in the world to do with their salvation. It had to do with the fact that they were to have fellowship with God. Now, you will notice that they're not to eat leavened bread. And beginning here in verse 17, it says, Ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. And they ate the unleavened bread on the wilderness march, you see, because they began the night of the Passover. And they then ate the bread for seven days. And you notice that it's unleavened bread. If they ate leavened bread, they were cut off. That means they were cut off from the fellowship. There'd be no fellowship at all. Now, right here is put down a principle concerning leaven. Leaven is mentioned here. Oh, about, I suppose, eight or nine times from verse 14 down through verse 20. Well, let me read verse 19. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which be leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leaven. In all your habitation shall ye eat unleavened bread. Now, this is very important because it puts down a principle here that when you move into the New Testament, it doesn't go into reverse and mean the opposite. 
Leaven is a principle of evil, and it represents that which is offensive. Now, we'll have occasion to refer to that again. But when you get to the 13th of Matthew and you read about a woman hiding leaven in three measures of meal, that leaven isn't the gospel. It couldn't be because leaven is a principle of evil. Actually, the three measures of meals, the Word of God, and in it there has been put leaven today, and that's evil. There has been put unsound doctrine. And I am absolutely overwhelmed and amazed to see the amount of error that's being taught today and how gullible people are that just go for it. fact of the matter is, the rackets, and there are many of them, do lots better than those of us that attempt to just teach the simple Word of God. You'll find out we're having our problems, but not the cults or isms. They're having no problem at all. This matter of leaven, it's evil, friends, and it has been put into the teaching of the Word. All occults and isms use the Bible, but they put leaven with it. And that is the thing that the children of Israel were told to avoid. And when our Lord made it very clear that it couldn't be good, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And actually the disciples at that time thought he meant physical bread. Then they understand later that he meant the doctrine of the Pharisees. That which is evil, you say. And that principle is put down here. Now, unleavened bread is not palatable. There are a great many people today that don't like the study of the Bible. I recognize that. A great many people love to come to a church for the social time or the music or the beauty of the place, but not for the Word of God. They don't want the Word of God because actually unleavened bread is not very palatable. I happened to be in Israel during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I stayed in the Dan Carmel Hotel in Haifa. And friends, I want to say very candidly, I never got as tired of unleavened bread in my life because I was brought up in the South where we had hot biscuits, the kind that just puff right up, and not unleavened bread. Oh, but the night it was over, and they brought out the bread, the real article, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, because that's good to the natural man, you see, and they brought out lamb fixed. Oh, it was delicious. It was really a feast, not only for those of us that were there that were Gentiles and Christians, but also for those that were in the land, citizens of the nation Israel. Unleavened bread, friends, is not as delightful, and it's not as palatable, not as tasty as the leavened bread is. But may I say that The Word of God is the food that's for the child of God. Now, this is a great principle put down here, as you can see. Now, he goes on and says in verse 22, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Now, there are several things to note here. I wonder if it had had occurred to you as we have been looking at this matter of the Passover. And now for two times, we've talked about the putting of the blood on the doorpost. Have you wondered just how they did it? How did they put the blood on the doorpost? Well, hyssop is a little plant that grows around rocks in a damp place. It is a fluffy type of a little plant, and it was dipped into the blood and then applied. It was the applicator. And again, the hyssop represents to me faith. That is the way that the blood is applied to your heart and my life. Someone says, how do you apply? By faith, trusting what Christ has done for us when he died for us. Now, we find here that God goes into a great deal of detail in telling these people about 
how they are to do at this particular time. He gives specific instructions. Now in verse 29, why we see now this is the last judgment, the last plague that's coming on the land of Egypt, and God had prepared his people from it. Now, the land of Goshen had escaped the last three plagues, but would not escape here unless there was the blood on the doorpost. And any Egyptian could put it on his doorpost. All he'd had to do was just believe God, and the death angel wouldn't have gone in and asked, are you an Israelite? That's going to surprise a lot of people someday when they're going to find out that the Lord's not going to ask the name of the church you belong to. Because if you have trusted Christ, the Spirit of God has baptized you into the body of believers, and that is today, of course, the true church. Now will you notice, and I begin reading now at verse 29 of the 12th chapter of Exodus, came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house, for there was not one dead. You see, the firstborn in each house. This is the last judgment. In other words, God up to this point has not touched human life. He's not taken human life, but now he does. And don't say that God is a murderer. The Lord giveth and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When you are able to create life, then you'll be able to take it away. But wait until you can do that. Now will you notice verse 30? And Pharaoh rose up in the night. You see, this is something that was tragic. Now, verse 31, he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks, your herds, as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. Poor old Pharaoh now, he's had to give up up to this point. He's been reluctant, but now what has happened, it's reached in and touched his own son. And believe me, this is where you really get an individual. Now, you see, God didn't begin with this plague. He began way back there by just throwing down a rod, and that rod becoming a crocodile. That could have been the message that if he had believed God, the children of Israel could have gone out then, and he'd spared his people these judgments. Therefore, don't blame it on God. God is making him release the children of Israel, which he was reluctant to do. And the Egyptians, I'm reading verse 33, and the Egyptians were urging upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we be all dead men. They didn't know where this would end. And of course, what would be the next step? If God now took the firstborn, what could he do next? Well, the next thing to do would be to bring death to all the Egyptians. And so Pharaoh and the people said, we want you out of here because we're afraid what will come next. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their knee troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. This matter of borrowing is they're collecting back dues. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them. The literal back of borrowed is they ask. And here they lent, they gave unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Actually, the Egyptians owed them so much that when they left, they spoiled them. Now, verse 37, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. Now, you can see where uh, Dr. Kyle got his figures on which he attempted to base the number that came out of the land of Egypt. Well, how many did come out of the land of Egypt? We're going to get to that when we get to the book of Numbers, actually, 
but it would seem that there came out of the land of Egypt well over a million people. There were 600,000 on foot that were men. This had nothing to do with the children or the women. And then here our attention is called to something else. Verse 38, And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. Now, this mixed multitude will be the trouble in the camp. Who were the mixed multitude? Well, let me stop for just a moment, because in the book of Numbers, in the 11th chapter, I'll go into a great deal of detail about them, because they were the troublemakers. Well, factually, they were half-breeds. An Egyptian had married a Jewish maiden or a Hebrew had married an Egyptian maid. And then there was the offspring. And now the question comes to him, long as they lived in the land of Egypt, there's no question, no decision to make. But now, what shall he do? Shall the half-breed, shall he go up with the children of Israel, or shall he stay? Well, many of them didn't know. Many of them didn't go up. And some thought they should go up. And then they wondered whether... When the going got hard and difficult, they wondered whether they hadn't made a mistake. And they were the first ones to complain. And by the way, they were not Israelites in the true sense of the word. That's been a big problem for Israel over there today, is a half-breed, a Gentile mother. Does that mean that the offspring are Israelites, are the citizens of Israel? It's always been a problem with them, and it's always caused them trouble. And by the way, we have that same thing in the church. we got people that join the church. They're not saved. They're just part of the mixed multitude. And always the complaining and trouble comes from that crowd. I've never believed that a troublemaker in church is really a child of God. Now, I've been a pastor a long time, but let's understand what we mean by troublemakers. But we'll see that when we get to the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers, and that will be coming up. Now we find here that the children of Israel now, they're leaving, they're taking off. Verse 39, And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, and neither had they prepared for themselves any vigil. In other words, the children of Israel were not really prepared for the journey. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It's a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And as we said before, this is the oldest observance, the Passover of any religious holiday in the world today, and it goes back to the exodus out of the land of Egypt. They're never to forget that until the king comes and the millennium is established, and then they'll forget it. We'll see that, of course, later. And we are told that only those that were Israelites were to eat the Passover. Now we're told, verse 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. When a stranger shall sojourn with you, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. In other words, that would be an act of faith on the part of a Gentile to come up and under the covenant God made with Abraham. Now we are told in verse 49, one law shall be to him that is home-born, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Now we're going to follow through here a section in which we're going to see them cross the Red Sea and then the experiences that these people had in the wilderness, which correspond to Christian experience today. This, my friend, is a rich section. We trust that you're going through the Bible with us. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
You know, you can listen to today's message again at ttb.org, or if you need some help with what you're looking for, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And as always, we're so grateful for your company on the Bible Bus today, and we look forward to next time. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be sure to save you a seat. Jesus made it Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world, and we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?